All right. Well, oh, we have somebody coming in in person here yet with us. Hey, welcome. Come on in and sit down. <laughs> um, if you want, yeah, you can even come and pull up a chair. Let's pull the chair outside here. Okay. Yeah, we're doing audio from okay. this corner. Okay. I just want to be out of camera. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's fine too. Sure. We'll we'll adjust if we need. <laughs> I know it's eventually going to be online, maybe. Sure, like yes. Thought, oh, I'm free this morning. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Yeah. All right, there's a couple of us here at Sister Bay, and uh, we'll get started. So welcome to today's program with the Door County Reads 2024 event series. I'm Christina Johnson, the branch manager here at the Sister Bay Liberty Grove Library. I'm also a member of the Door County Reads Committee this year. And this year's Door County Reads book, Braiding Sweetgrass for Young Adults, has been widely shared throughout the Door County community and across our five school districts. Our series of related events is focused with First Nation speakers, and the events are funded in part by a grant from the Wisconsin Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the state of Wisconsin. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this project do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. In conjunction with this year's read, today's program is the Burt Lake Band Traditional Foods Project, Black Ash Basketry and Sweetgrass Restoration presented by Kathy Kay, Director of the Burt Lake Band Traditional Foods Project in Northern Lower Michigan. Oh, we have somebody else coming in here, one second. Okay. <laughs> um, Kathy will discuss their successful traditional foods project and Three Sisters Garden in the Burt Lake Band of Ottawa and Chippewa community. Kathy is also a black ash basket maker and will share about black ash basketry and sweetgrass restoration, including how sweetgrass is used in the baskets that she makes. Thank you for those in person here at the Sister Bay Library and um, at our watch party here, as well as those at the watch party at the Ridges and Bailey's Harbor, Sturgeon Bay Library, and everybody that's online um, various parts of the world from home. For those online, please use the chat box to share comments and questions. We can't promise that we will try to cover each um, at the end, and we thank you for your participation. We would like to recognize the land here and across this region for our eight library branches and event locations with our land acknowledgement in Door County, Wisconsin. The Door County Reads Committee acknowledges the original peoples and primary caretakers of this peninsula from time immemorial. The Potawatomi, Menominee, Ho-Chunk, Odawa, Ojibwe, Petun, Huron, and Sauk peoples. The land we stand on today is part of the ancestral and historical homelands of each of these nations. We pay respect to those roots and connections and the traditional ecological knowledge that is present and vital today. May we appreciate those who came before us and commit to partnering with and learning from First Nations today and into the future. We are honored to share this time together. A little bit about our speaker today. Kathy Kay is descended from the Eastern Cherokee. Her ancestors moved up through Kentucky before the Trail of Tears and over a period of time, eventually made their way to Ontonagon County, Michigan in the UP. And they worked in the lumber camps there. Kathy is also an adopted citizen of the Burt Lake Band of Ottawa and Chippewa in Northern Lower Michigan. Kathy is also a grant writer and holds her MA in US history with the Great Lakes Native American History Focus from UW-Madison which is where we first became dear friends uh, nearly 20 years ago. My goodness, <laughs> as UW like Madison, I know, <laughs> as UW Madison students and Ojibwe language learners. Um, Kathy apprenticed under Wesson Dillard, Little Traverse Band, a Bay Band of Odawa to learn black, uh, traditional black ash basketry and has been weaving for over 15 years. She also does quilt plating, beadwork, hide tanning and rawhide, mitts and moccasins, as well as quilting and many other things. <laughs> um, Kathy has been an Indigenous foods foraging plant identification educator as well as or as an environmental outreach coordinator and director of a traditional arts project for the Burt Lake Band of Ottawa and Chippewa in Brutus, Michigan, and currently the director of the traditional foods program of which we'll speak, she will speak about today. Miigwech for joining us, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk uh, about this stuff today. Um, so I, for, as an introduction, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the Burt Lake Band and, and thank you, Christine, too, Christina. Um, the um, talk about the Burt Lake Band 
of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, also known as the Anishinaabe people. Um, their homeland is in Brutus, Michigan, which is like Christina said, is the um, Northern Lower Michigan. It's about a half hour south of the Mackinac Bridge. So it's up there a ways. And um, like many tribes lost their land um, due to treaties and um, specifically lost um, the last of their land in 1900. And I'll explain why I'm, I'm explaining this in just a minute. Um, the, uh, when they, they never did receive a reservation or never got a re re land designated as a reservation area. And um, so in the 1800s, uh, later 1800s, they bought with their annuity monies, they bought some, um, maybe 375 acres. Actually, it wasn't late 1800s, it was earlier. But, um, and they put that land in trust with the governor of Michigan. And that meant that that land should, should have stayed theirs. And um, in 1900, they were living in a, I believe there were about 70 people living in a village um, on Indian Point at, along Burt Lake. And um, they're called Burt Lake Band, and there's also a lake called Burt Lake right next to them. And um, the local sheriff and um, a land speculator uh, finagled uh, the with the the tax office, saying that they that the tribe owned owed taxes on that land, which because it was in trust, um, they didn't own that. But somehow they were able to um, get the lien to that land for back taxes. And when the, the men were off in a nearby uh, town that was 20 miles away, they had to walk there. They were told to go there to pick up their paychecks for the week. When they were there, the um, these two men and with some helpers went out to the village out there and they had log cabins and they forced the women and children and elders out of those homes and poured kerosene on their log cabins and burned them all out. And so they were forced to spread out. And um, today they're still fighting for their reaffirmation of their federal uh, status with the, the United States government. They're, today they're considered a state recognized tribe and they're operating under a 501c nonprofit. Um, like I said, still fighting to regain their federal status. They're a small tribe of only about 290 people. And the reason, well, let me just say this before I go on. If you want to learn more about this, there you can go on burtlakeband.org and to their website. And there's also recently a friend of the tribe, Richard Wiles, wrote a book, um, A Cloud Over the Land, if you want to learn more about that. Or you can Google some of that. You can Google the burnout and learn about that. But um, I mentioned this loss of land because with loss of land comes loss of um, food security or, or a connection to the land, uh, the food resources. Because they lost that land, they lost their food resources also. That's why when we, um, when we decided we wanted to try to write a, a grant funded project, um, we thought it'd be important to bring some of that traditional knowledge back with, um, with the, the gifts of the land. Should actually say too, to start out that um, I wrote the grant and we called it the traditional foods grant, but I probably should have written that it more in, with the language being more of gifts from the land because some of the foods that we learned about aren't necessarily, it's ambiguous on like if you would call it traditional or not. What for one, dandelions are um, a really good food source and we learned about those through this project, but dandelions weren't native to this land. They came in the 1600s with Europeans bringing them here, but um, they're a very good food source. So we included that. So really, let's think of it. I, I'll, I'll use traditional foods, but let's think of it as more as gifts of food from the land rather than the traditional because we do add those other things in there. Just let me continue. So let's talk about the traditional foods part of it. 
Um, this is an uh, um, administration for Native Americans funded grant project. It's three year grant or three year project. And the project itself has three parts. So the first part is our teachings where we learn about animal and plant foods. The second part are recipes where we asked our tribal citizens to uh, look in their recipe books or their, you know, their little file recipe files and try to find recipes that their, their, maybe their parents or their grandparents um, had that included traditional foods, like the things that we're going to learn, that we were going to learn to, to harvest foods off the land. So um, we had a little bit of a hard time with um, getting people to give us recipe because, because they thought they they didn't have what we needed. They thought that they didn't fit in that. So what we ended up doing was asking for recipes um, that uh, maybe were their fa favorite family recipes that have been passed down through a couple of generations. And then we took those recipes and we incorporated this food from the land into these recipes. And and the the actually the the project itself, um, the grant was written that way that we would incorporate these foods into contemporary recipes. That way it makes it more easily accessible to, to make things rather than if you had to go out and, and um, have only just traditional foods in your recipe, that might be hard for some people. And we wanted it to be where people can actually use, use these. You know, we want, want them to get back into using the food off the land as, as it should be. So then the third part of this project is our, our stories. And um, we were going to, we asked people to provide stories for us. We wrote in that we would have 40 stories. All of this um, that we're learning is going into a book at the end of this project, which we're in the third year now. And it'll be printed and all the Burt Lake Band citizens will get a copy of the book. So that way our uh, part of the culture is preserved and passed on through generations. But um, so the stories, again, people thought, I don't I don't think we have what you're looking for. But if we found that if we could get people to sit down and interview them, that they were full of stories, they just didn't realize um, that they were there or they thought their stories weren't good enough. But we got some really good ones. And um, what, what we wanted was stories of, you know, what did your grandparents used to pick or, or do you still go out? Do you fish? Do you hunt? Any of that? And um, and we got a lot of, of really nice stories. And one of the, and some funny ones, but what our our most beloved tribal elder, Kenny Parkey, he's 83, or he maybe just turned 84. Um, he he had a lot of stories. And and um one of them was when he was four years old, he went out blackberry picking with his uh, mother. And so he's just a little guy and the blackberries grew, would grow taller than him. And he was just on the edge picking up under the plant, plants, under the bushes. It was a big patch in the woods and they had just gotten there. And then his mother said, um, let, let's go. And, and he, he was like, why? And, and um, he remembers her being, her being real adamant, like, come on, back up, let's go. And, um, she didn't want to freak him out, but there was a bear on the other side of that berry patch. And she didn't want him to freak out and start running because the bear might chase him. But those were the kind of stories that, that we were looking for. So the book will have uh, pictures of all of our um, plant, plants that we learned about or, or um, animals and a little bit of information about them. And then we'll, I think the format's going to be that. And then, then we'll follow that up with a story that might apply to that, that, that we collected. And then, uh, and then a recipe in which you can use it. So we want it to be a real functional. We want people to, to be really be able to use the book. And that will also go up for sale on the BertLightBand.org website. Uh, once it's up, but it should be by the end of the year, it should be by her sale, if anyone's interested. But um, it's going to be more of a relaxed, just kind of a fun, interesting, um, enjoyable book, not 
not real academic or real detailed, just just um, real informational. So um, some of the things, let me make sure I'm staying on track here. Um, some of the things that um, we harvested, here, let me use my cursor and that might help. Okay. So this first plant here is, of course, a cattail. And um, a lot of times uh, people think of this fuzzy stuff as just the plants drying up and, um, and that's really pollen. And you have a very short window. You're lucky probably if you have a two week window in order to collect this pollen. But what you do is you go out and you put a little paper bag over that and bend it a little bit. Don't wanna hurt the plant and shake it. First off, I should say, um, that before we harvest anything, we always uh, put our asama down, our tobacco, and say a prayer and ask that um, you know that we can have it. Tell tell the plant or the animal our name, and then um, what we want to do with it. And if we get a feeling like sometimes, like when I do harvest black ash trees, I get a feeling like this. If you get a feeling like, yeah, that's that plant doesn't really want to be harvested. Then we just leave it alone because um, they'll really let you know. And Robin talks about that in, in breeding sweetgrass, um, that, that you pay attention and you, you feel the energy of the plant, what it's trying to tell you. So, so we always start out, anytime we're harvesting anything, we start out um, with that, that prayer of asking for it and, and giving it thanks, letting it know that we appreciate it. So... So like I said, you take a little brown paper bag, you put it over that cattail and you shake it. And then the pollen all just poof and, and, and falls into the bag. Then you take it home and you can put it in, um, a popular thing to do with it is put it in pancake dough, pancake batter, and it gives extra protein to your pancakes. And, um, and then we also learn to harvest the shoots of the cattail, which is the part that's just barely coming out, you know, in, under the water. And, um, and that part tastes like a cucumber. So, but one thing we, we, we do is, um, what we learned is, is cattails absorb moisture. I mean, they're all water inside. So you want to make sure that you're in a clean area with, um, without toxins, like runoff from cars going by or anything like that, because those cattails will absorb that. And you don't want to be consuming that. I don't know if I mentioned that we did the, we went out to learn about the foods in uh, teaching, like a workshop setting. We call them teachings. So um, we would bring people in that knew. Once in a while, we had um, tribal members that knew this. So um, otherwise, we brought in people outside of the tribe or from other tribes. And they, we did a workshop setting and took people out. And what we would do is we'd go out, ident learn how to identify We'd harvest some and then we'd go back to the tribal office and then prepare it and get a little taste of it. So so it was all encompassing on how, sure, here's the plant, but how are you going to use it? So that was the cattails. Then we had uh, June berries and we just got really lucky that at the tribal office there, there's um, uh, June berry trees and bushes, trees, they're more like trees. And um, there's four or five of them there. And so we harvested those. While we were out harvesting, we look up and here's this little chipmunk up in the tree. I think we surprised it and it just kind of froze there like, hope they don't see me. But you see his little cheeks are just full of berries. That was the most adorable little thing. And he just sat there while we were picking, but but it was a reminder of we're not the only ones that, that eat this food. And we want to be mindful of those who do eat it and not to take all of it not not even take i i believe robin says in the book don't only take half but we didn't even take half of things um and because there's uh birds just love these june berries and such and um and that if you pay attention nature will show you these things this little guy was right there well guy or girl was there to tell us you know don't get greedy so I should also mention, too, that right now the tribe has 20 acres of land that a Catholic church uh, donated to them, um, I want to say about 10 years back. 
and it's right next to the um their cemetery that that Burt Lake Band maintains. So that's where this this uh, tree is, or four or five Juneberry trees, and we made jam out of that, and you can make sauce. It was really good. So um, and then down here we have uh, spruce trip tips. If you get those early in the spring, you can see like it's the new branch parts of the branches growing out and you harvest just a few of those and um you can pick you know a few on each tree but but the tree needs those too so we don't take them all right so i thought that spruce tips would be bitter because i just think of pine as maybe being bitter or something but those are real citrusy tasting and online there is a um spruce tip key lime pie that uh one of our tribal members made in it. it that was so good and it was um or you can also take those and dry them and mix them with salt and have a spruce tip salt sprinkle on meats or in a salad and um we even froze some that was freshly freshly picked and they lasted in the in and these are black ash baskets that that i made that i'll talk about later but um, here's the dandelions I was talking about. We made um, the honey dandelion shortbread cookies out of those, which were, were they were different, but, but they were good. Um, but, and then we picked violets and we made jelly out of that. And that was delicious. Um, one thing we wanted to make sure was that we didn't pick too many of those because those come out in the spring and the bees um need that food so we just picked here and there i picked some in our yard i went to my mom's and picked some but i didn't didn't pick all the ones i saw because i saw bees were on there too and then these are uh, ostrich ferns there but when they're at this phase there people call them fiddleheads and um those are just delicious and they taste a lot like uh like young um tender asparagus and there's a way you have to prepare them because they have a little bit of a toxin, excuse me, on the outside of them. But if you boil it, that it boils the toxin off. But um, that was something that we especially wanted to make sure we didn't harvest too much of. It grows up in three or four, sometimes seven little curls like that. And you only want to take a couple in that, in that bunch of seven because you want to make sure that it's going to keep growing the next year. Um, I'll give you an example of something that uh, someone over harvested and damaged the damaged it was there was a patch of a uh, nice really nice patch of leeks or some people call them ramps but wild leeks growing in the in the on some state land and uh, one of our tribal members would always go out there and harvest while well, you just pick some leaves or if you pick bulbs, you just pick a very, very few. You don't take a whole clump and you don't take all the leaves. And someone was out there, a uh, uh, guy and his family, and they were digging them all up. And they were they were all uh, happy and saying, we're going to make leek soup. And they probably went home and had some very delicious leek soup, but they ruined that patch. Um, it's very sparse now. And... I suppose a year, years down the road, it'll come back, but it had been there for years already and people had harvested responsib responsibly with it, but this, this family didn't and they ruined that patch and that's really very sad to do. And it's greedy, but sometimes people don't realize what they're doing too. Um, let me see what else we have some of the other foods. I don't have a picture of these ones is we had Greg Johnson from La Lac de Flambeau Reservation. He came over and taught us how to take maple syrup and make sugar. That was real traditional, make maple sugar. And what he did was before it got to the sugar point, it gets real thick. And then he made these, hopefully you can see it, these little cones. And we filled it up with the, the, sugar and it's more like candy but it, it, it when it got in there it was hard the stick is to hold the cone together and it it hardens in there and then he said people would um hang these this is basswood um the inner bark of basswood and um 
hang them inside their house. And then when they had company over and they wanted to give a little gift, they'd send them home with one of these, which I think is a very nice, thoughtful thing to do. Um, we mentioned leeks. We also harvested mushrooms, blueberries, wild blueberries. Um, they also had wintergreen berries growing in with the blueberries dispersed through there. So you can put the leaves in tea and you can eat the berries. The berries have somewhat of a, um, an aspirin effect to them. They're, they're more medicinal than, than just food. Um, one thing that's my favorite that I learned that I didn't know you could, could eat are thistle stems. I mean, if you see a thistle and people always want to rip those out and get rid of them because they're pokey, um, that stem that goes right up the center. And you like to get them when they're more tender because they can get chewy and hard. But um, you take a knife and, you know, kind of scrape off the, the thorns on the thistle and then peel it and eat the inside. And it's really fresh and crisp and watery. And it tastes a lot like celery. We also did apple cider, which is more of a contemporary thing, but that's a real popular one. And, and for teas, we did sweet fern, which uh, I'm sure I had walked past it before, but I never knew how to identify it. But now I do. It's a real obvious looking plant. You can harvest that any time of the year. You dry it and put it in teas. And it, I like to have it in the evening because it relaxes you. It's not a sedative or anything like that, but it just calms you down. And one of our tribal members, husband said that that um, he thought it helped with his blood pressure because it calmed him down. And then, then we harvested Labrador tea, tea um, white pine needles we made tea from, and then stinging nettles. And again, you have to be careful about how, of course, how you harvest that. But once you boil the nettle leaves, the, the stinging part goes away. Okay, let's see. Okay, we also harvested, um, onto the next slide, um, wild rice. Dan Hinman from the Little Traverse Bay Band came and helped us um, learn how to wild rice. And I've been doing it for years in Wisconsin when I lived there, but um, he came over and took, took everybody out and explained how it all goes. And uh, he's been doing wild rice, uh, Manuman is how you say it in, the, in Ojibwe. Um, restoration on this lake and it's he's they're real happy with how it's been coming along they go out and reseed it every year and now it's to a point where it can be harvested in Michigan and so we harvested it you want to make sure you have someone that knows how to handle a canoe we did have somebody take a little swim uh, this year but uh, but they were okay but we had to go and rescue them but um but it was they might not have thought it was funny, but everybody else thought it was kind of funny. But um, so so then you harvest the rice. I won't go into it just for time constraints, but um, one thing I really like about harvesting wild rice is there are little worms in that rice sometimes. And um, it's also, a if you don't like spiders, this is not a, a job for you because when you get out there in Wisconsin, um, when I, first time I went, uh, ricing, I was in the canoe and, uh, and we stopped to just have lunch on the water. We had a little cooler and maybe the time it takes to eat a sandwich, I had, um, spider webs all over my legs and spiders don't bother me. But if, if you're a person who freaks out over spiders, probably not, probably best you don't go out or you learn how to handle spiders, but there are little bitty spiders and everything in this world has a purpose so those tiny little spiders are helping to eat those those um rice worms so um so back to after we harvested it then when you take it home you have to dry it all out before you parch it and so we put it on tarps and spread it all out nice nice and thin on the tarp in the sun for a few days to let the sun dry it and what I just love is those little worms, if they're on the edge, they can get off. But if, they, if they're if they not on the edge of the tarp, they don't travel very fast. And little um, yellow jackets, because this is in the fall, 
when yellow jackets are really hungry, they'll come down and grab the worms and take them off. And so they're cleaning the, the worms out for us. We're bringing the rice in with worms. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's just beautiful. We, we bring the worms with the rice and then they come down and take it away and they're cleaning our rice for us. So I just love that part. And last year we had a praying mantis crawl out on there and it was just a blast to watch him grab those worms. And I'm sure that praying mantis really liked it too. Mantis. But um, so this is a birch bark winnowing basket. After we parch it, you throw it up. This is a traditional way of doing it. Toss it up in the air. Hope that you have a nice breeze. And um, and this is after you dance on it or you put it through a machine to get it. Um, boy, I'm jumping around. Let me say, when you do the rice, then you put it in a pot over a slow fire and you get it just warm enough where you're drying the rice out and that loosens up the, the husk on the rice. Each grain of rice has a husk on it. And um, then traditionally, and we did that the first year, you get a little hole in the ground and put lay leather on it and somebody puts on a brand new pair of moccasins and then somebody's singing a song and using a hand drum and then that person dances on the rice and it breaks that husk off, really just grinding the feet over the rice. And then it goes into that winnowing basket and then you you shake it up and the heavy rice comes straight down and the, the husk that got peeled off, broke away from the grain, um, blows out. And so that that's a very long and time consuming way to do it. And it's how they used to do it traditionally, but they had their whole communities would do it. Families would all do it together. Now we have a ricing machine that we put it into. So that's the rice part. This is Barb, or this is Barb Richmond. She's 80. I believe she's 80 now. This is her daughter, Deb Richmond. These two are just wonderful assets to our tribe because they're just happy, bouncy people who, and they know how to get things done. So it's just, they're so motivating to be around. So they're out there when we went out smelt dipping and we didn't get any because it wasn't a good year, but we learned how to do it. Then we had another teaching was we had Martin Reinhardt come and um, from Marquette and he helped us build a birch bark, look like a teepee kind of um, with poles and, and this is a fish smoker. So we, he brought lake trout we wove little branches and made grates and um, and then wrapped that birch all the way around that. And then just, we didn't have a fire under it because it'd get too hot, but we just took coals and kept dumping them under there. And that that was um, that was just a, a blast and a, one of the more popular teachings that we had also. So um, let's go to the next one is our recipes. So we're, we were doing all three of these at, at the same time, teachings, gathering recipes, gathering stories. This is an example of how, here's our cookies, dandelion cookies we made. But um, this is an example of this applesauce cake right here. Um, we, uh, is an example of Deb and Barb Richmond that was on the, that were smelting. I just had the picture of, they had, uh, so Barb always made that for Deb growing up. And then Deb always made it for his, her kids growing up. So two generations of this applesauce cake. And it was a regular applesauce cake, a good one. And um, so we took that recipe and we mixed in some manuman, some wild rice flour that we ground up into flour. We added sweet fern. And instead of using white refined sugar, we used maple sugar. You can also use maple syrup. And then we added cranberries and, um, oh, and then we also cooked wild rice and mixed it in with the batter before we baked it. And, and that was a big success. We had taste testing at tribal council meetings every month and people really loved that one. So that's a good example of how we took a recipe and kind of like a contemporary recipe and, and added some traditional foods in there. This one over here is someone's pea salad, green, like little green pea salad. 
but instead of putting peas in it, we put cattail shoots and leeks, leek bulbs, and I believe there's some um, thistle stem in there also, and bacon. Who doesn't love bacon if you're not a vegetarian? Um, the it, well, it turned out to be a very, very good, real refreshing recipe, and that went over really well. And then this is venison with fiddleheads and and leek bulbs. You can also um, dry the leek leaves and um, mix it with salt and have leek salt. You can um, make leek pesto out of it as well. And, and that can be used in a lot of things, the pesto. And then this is the smelt. And make sure, I'm looking at my notes because I want to make sure I don't forget anything. Okay, to the next one. One wonderful thing that happened with this project is we we were able to, to install Three Sisters Garden, and that was not written into the grant project. We thought we would keep it more like the food you find on the land, not, not that you've cultivated. So, um, but one of our uh, tribal members in the first year um, donated $500 to the project. And we thought, wow, what do we want to do? And her mother had recently walked on and, and she was a big gardener. So we thought, well, in honor of Isabel Scallon, we'll, um, we'll put in a three sisters garden. And that meant a lot to the family, uh, you know, her, her Isabel's children, grow, you know, grown children. But um, so we put in a three sisters garden. And what that is, is corn. You can see there's the corn stalk. And then you have beans and the, the corn stalk provides a trellis for the beans to grow up. And this is a very traditional pre-contact also um, method of growing. And, um, and um, so the bean will grow up the corn stalk. What the bean does is it provides nitrogen in the soil for the next year's crop. And then we planted um, squash. So when we so you plant the corn, and then you plant the beans maybe a little bit when later when the corn is maybe three, four inches tall, maybe not even that tall, plant the beans. And then you let those grow a little bit and then you plant the squash. And all we have to do is weed, I think maybe twice. And uh, once these squash leaves grow up, you plant it in, in um, on hills and you plant it fairly densely, not in rows. And that squash spreads all out on its own. We didn't have to guide it where we wanted it to go. And it covers that entire garden and it retains moisture. And it also shades it so the weeds can't grow. And it's just wonderful to have a garden that you don't have to weed. And, um, and then you just sit back and watch it grow and make sure it has water. And um, the proper amount of water. And, and it was so amazing to watch that grow. This is the harvest that we got the first year out of a 16 by 24 foot garden. And um, I don't remember now how many squash we got. This is Canada crookneck squash. It's a winter squash. And um, I highly recommend it because it, it tastes wonderful. Butternuts actually came out of a crookneck, um, Canada crookneck squash. And I think they call some kind of like a little yellow squash crookneck, but that's not what this is. This is Canada crookneck and it's a winter squash. We used Abenaki um, rose flint corn. I have a friend who's Abenaki out in, in uh, New Hampshire and she, re she recommended that. So that's what we grew and it did really well. Our beans did not do well. Um, I think they got, we planted them too early before the corn got a little bit big enough and then they got or planted them too late, I think. And then they got shaded out. So, you know, it, having a garden is a live and learn experience. I heard a saying like you learn more about three or mistakes than what is a success. So we did learn when to plant those. This is our community um, taking the shells off the, or the kernels off the cobs. I like that picture because it's several people working together, um, symbolic of community work. Then we, we, through the project, we were able to purchase a hand grinding stone. 
that uh, or you know grinding stone that you you turn by hand. So we ground our own corn because it's a flint corn; it gets dry. And um, we ground it, and we made um, one of our recipes. Sometimes we'd make them up our recipes too, and um, we would um, we ground the corn. We put wild blueberries in there. That's a little orange zest, not traditional. We just threw that on there, and then we took sumac. Um, puree, um, the red fuzz on the sumac berries, and um, boiled that up and got a puree going. It was just a beautiful red when we put it in that bowl. And then we set down the cornbread on top of that and it absorbed it. I got that idea from Leora Taggerson. I should um, cite her as being the original one that I saw it from. I don't know, but um, she's a really nice person. And then, uh, so I stole it is what I'm trying to say, <laughs> but she, she is okay with it. But so this is the crookneck squash and, um, the can of crookneck squash and one of the really big hits. I, I want to say maybe the biggest hit of all the recipes we made was I, we cut that up and made, um, squash soup with it. We put, um, andouille sausage in with it. And then we, we cooked it all up and pureed it all together. And then we, um, put, I put leek pesto in it. And, uh, one of our tribal citizens said, I went home and made that because we handed out this squash. It, we just, we grow the food and hand it out to our community members. And, um, he made it and he's like, it didn't taste the same because they didn't have the leek pesto in it. But, um, that pesto really sets it off. So, um, let me see where we're at okay so that's all of our what we have about the traditional foods project and at the end there'll be time for questions so if anybody has any of that uh, remember it or put it in the chat and then i'll go on i'll just keep talking because i don't want to run out of time um next i'm going to talk here you can see the the three sisters garden how tall it gets and um so next i'm going to talk about um the healing garden we had a, a university of michigan grad student contact the tribe her name is eva ruse highly energetic i don't think anybody could outwork that girl and she's she's just amazing and she's a landscape artist is what she was going for and now she's graduated and, and moved you know and is is doing that but she contacted the tribe and said for her her grad project her master's project what would we like to see done? And she spoke with elders and uh, other members. And it was actually Isabel Scallon again um, that I mentioned with the with the garden. Um, she suggested um, a healing garden because so many tribal people go through um, traumatic um, historical trauma or you know boarding schools, those types of things. This is a a healing garden that is there for um, our tribal members and anybody that they invite out there to sit amongst those plants and and feel peaceful and it's a safe environment so she has planted um i believe it might even be more than this but i i'm going to say just for for what i do know 125 plants that are native to the area native to, to the area around Brutus. And um, there are all kinds of plants, flowering stuff, shrubby kind of plants and cedar, the four, the four you know, uh, directional plants with cedar and um, tobacco. Well, I grew the tobacco, but that does really well up there. And then sage and, and um, sweet grass. So this right here is, if you were to see an aerial view of it, it looks, it's a medicine garden is, is, I, is what you would call it. And it has the four directions, north, south, east, and west. And, um, and then the plants associated with those directions um, are all in these and people can walk through them. And, and then my husband and I made these cedar top benches and those are out there. And then right here, if you can see in the middle there, there's a, um, a uh, ceremonial fire pit that was, when they made this, it was only supposed to be for ceremonies or sacred, sacred gatherings. And when we went out and did our wild rice, 
I um, wanted to parch the wild rice in that fire pit. And um, someone said, but this is a, a ceremonial fire pit. So I talked to the elders and they agreed that I don't know what more, how more you could get uh, more um, sacred than to be parching uh, traditional food over over that fire. And they agreed that, that that in itself is a ceremony. So we did use that fire pit for that. And um, but one of the things that I really just love that that Eva did was um she planted sweet grass in these canoes. She buried them, and this you can tell the, the land is real sandy, the soil is, and not a good environment for sweet grass. It's not wet enough. So she buried these canoes. There's no holes drilled in the bottom. And just on the edge of the woods where they get some shade, some, a lot of sun. And um, this one right here is three years old. And this one is on its second year. And um, what we did, um, I mean, you can see it's just so lush. And the first year when it was growing in both of these, we didn't harvest. The second years that they are growing, then we start harvesting. And, and as... Robin Walkimer talks about too, when you harvest uh, gifts from a land, they'll keep giving. If you have something that's a gift and you don't harvest it, you don't use it the proper way, you don't give thanks for it, it'll go away. And um, it won't do well. Now, I'm not saying that this land can't live without people because it surely can. But I'm saying that, um, that this reciprocation of we love that sweet grass. We harvest it. We use it on uh, Kenny Parking does quill boxes and uses the sweet grass on that. I can put it on my baskets. Um, I I harvested a lot of it and just put it into braids and handed it out to community members. And so this pat this one right here, we probably got four cuttings out of that in just one year, and it lasts. It stayed green through the end of August, which is amazing because we know of a sweet grass patch that's in the woods naturally growing and you usually harvest around the 4th of July. And then by the end of July, first part of August, it's starting to get yellow on the tips and this stayed just beautiful. And then, um, and then this year we're going to start harvesting this other one. Okay. Now let me see what time it is. 10 minutes to talk about black ash. Um, so I learned how to weave uh, in 2010 by, like uh, Christina said, um, um, Renee Dillard. It was my mentor for, for a couple of years. And, and then her mentor was John Pigeon, who was in that braiding sweetgrass. Um, but uh, so you have to identify, you have to know first, again, especially with black ash trees, um, because of the emerald ash borer killing them off, um, you want to make sure that you harvest, you, a you ask if you can harvest it. You put your sema down, you say a prayer. And if you, even if you want to make baskets so, so bad and, and you feel this nagging kind of, I say nagging, but it, it's more of a pulling that tree's talking to you, like, leave me alone, don't take me, then you, you should never take it because um, they know what they need. So when, we harvest black ash. Um, there's black ash and white ash, and then there's a mix between black and white. So to identify a true black ash, those leaves right here will connect right to that stem. A white ash will have a tiny little stem, and I can't remember what it's called. You have the main stem and a little stem and then the leaf, but the black ash will go right to the, the big stem and not have that little one. I do these presentations. Um, some of these presentations for fifth graders every year and um, in a school near nearby me. And I have this picture in there and I always say, what does that look like? And they always say, looks like a deer hoof. And um, it's, it's just awesome how you can see nature. Some people think chocolate chip, that looks like a split deer hoof to me. That's a very distinct bud for a black ash tree. You can harvest black ash trees any time of the year. Um, but what you want, if you get it in the spring, you can um, get that bark off. It'll come off because it'll be wet from the spring, like like a 
maple tree sucks the water up. All trees do that. And it'll, um, that bark will come off in one nice sheet. And then you can make, I don't know if you can see this um, and hear it. It's a, this is a bark basket. I don't know if you can see it in there either, but um, there's grooves in there. If you, if this bass, you have to make these when it's wet and you know how you can push on a banana peel and carve a design in it. You can do that on the inside of this bark too. And you can design, put designs in there before you make the basket. So the next step is, well, I will say too, uh, before I knew Lassan, my mentor, um, I saw her at Apollo and she was selling baskets. And I thought I saw just a little pencil basket, about maybe like this, big, that big around and this tall. And she had $30 on it at that time and years ago. And I thought, wow, that seems like a lot for a basket. And then I learned how to do it. And I'll explain all this, but I learned how to do it. And after I learned all the hard work it is, I told her, wow, you don't charge enough for your basket because there's a lot that goes in, a lot of physical labor that goes into harvesting these trees. So you have to take the log then. And then that's myself, my sister, and this is April Stone from the Bad River Reservation in Wisconsin. And you're, we have pounders and you have to pound all along here. I was told uh, traditionally that people used um, ironwood tree uh, to pound with, which would even be even harder. We have metal on the end of our poles there. So you have to pound all along that pole, that log, maybe uh, three, four times especially when you're first starting it um as you work down the log it you know the first layers are you're pounding on it it loosens them up better but it's breaking up the fibers between those growth rings usually you see a stump and it's like this and you can count the growth rings now we're looking at it sideways and it's pop pounding on that pops those growth rings up and you can just pull them off and they'll come out they'll come out in big long strips however long that log is the next step is, this is my granddaughter. She is 18 now, but I just love this picture of her. Um, you have to put it in a vise, that, that one growth ring that comes off. Put it in a vise and you score it with a knife and then you peel it. You peel that again. It feels like you're peeling a banana. And um, she's just concentrating on that. I just love it. And on the inside of that, where you split it, it's nice and shiny. If you see a black ash basket and it's nice and shiny, that's the inside of a growth ring. And um, and it's amazing to me. Like, I don't know how someone came up with this, knowing how to do this. Yeah, you know, it was a vision or a dream or an accident or something. But I just find it just fascinating how someone figured out that you can make baskets from a tree. So this is more woodworking rather than just weaving. So you peel it off and it comes off in a strip. This actually is a real tiny thin strip. Someone here is taking a knife and shaving the rough side of that. So the shiny side would be on underneath. She's shaving that off. And then you end up with all of these what are called splints at this point. And to me, that's like gold sitting on that. I would rather have these than gold because this is like, Christmas. You get all that work done and you have all this to weave with. So what can I make with that? These are the little baskets that I saw. I made all of these, but this was a size that was on, was selling for 30. And then I, then I thought, oh, you really need to raise your prices after I saw all the work that went into it. And um, I normally use natural colors. I don't use, I don't use a lot of dyes. And, um, but sometimes I do, this is a hamper. This is in a, I think a, um, city hall in a town in Wisconsin. They just contacted me and said, I want to, you know, somebody was assigned to decorate that place. So it's about two feet tall. This is dyed with walnut stains. You know, how you get a walnut falls right off the tree and it's that black stain. You mix that with water and then you can soak your ash in that and it'll give it another, give her a two-tone color basket. This is a, a kind of a traditional tote, if you will, like has uh, handles hanging down. 
it's bigger than a hand basket. It's hard to tell context there. There's another basket and these were used for picking berries. And if you look at the bottom of this, if I'm holding it in the right place, it's like football shape scored and then it's pointy. I don't know how it does it, but you can set that in the grass just like that. That's not leaning on anything. And, um, and it stands up. It, I don't know how it stands up. I mean, you pick back berries um, and it'll stand up for you. And then this is an ear of corn. And then you can pull that top off, the shucks off or shucks, what are those called, husks? I don't remember. You can peel that off, pull it off, and there's a basket inside. This takes me three days to make one of those. And it also takes me three days to make a strawberry one. Um, you have to, to weave the basket, and then you put a curl in every little spot that you can, and then you dye it the next day. And then I can make cattails. I have one right here. And... um. And it's just, just fascinating to me that you can take what was a tree and make little intricate designs and and make something artwork out of it, basically. Um, some of the other um, bas baskets are um, corn washing basket. Uh, when you have your flint corn, if you're going to wash it in hardwood ashes that I, I don't really have time to go into now, but then you have to rinse your ash your corn off, that helps the husks of the outer, the dry flint corn come off. You do it in this and then you're scrubbing on the side of it. And then this is a market basket. I didn't make this, I found it in a in an old shop. But um, a market basket, that's a twill weave bottom, different, different design. And, um, oh, that's what, that's the end of my slides. So um, if anyone has questions, I would be more than happy to take those. We're gonna unmute here. If you have any comments you wanna share. Your baskets are beautiful. Well, thank you. Interesting. They seem like a lot of work. They are a lot of work, <laughs> but very rewarding. Yeah, it's a spiritual connection. Feels like when you're when you're doing them, I feel like you can feel the center of the tree when you're working with it. Any questions from any of our other viewing sites or anybody online? No questions online at this point. Okay, um, Kathy, were there any other links or anything that you wanted to share with the group um, or a reminder about that book, what it's going to be called or when it's coming out? Sure. The book is out now and it's uh, called uh, Cloud Over the Land. It was written by a friend of the tribe, Richard Wiles, and um, you can get it at BurtLakeBand.org. It's B-U-R-T and uh, order it there. It's also available on Amazon. It's really a book of um, how the Burlick Band lost their land and and all the different, without going too deep into it, they were, mm, how do you say it properly? Screwed over, <laughs> that's not the proper way, but screwed over every time, every step of the way for they signed the 1836 treaty and never got land designated for the tribe. And then they, then, then they lost their land that they bought. And then the any reorganization act came around and they did everything they were supposed to do. And they, they didn't, um, weren't helped then. And, and there was miscommunication, mis misinterpretation of, um, treaties and uh so it's still they're still fighting for the federal status because the tribe because it's a state recognized 
um, tribe not federally recognized um, doesn't get treaty rights. And that I think that's very, very sad. So it's it's really detailed information on if you if you want to learn what happened, it's really it's a really good book as far as the details go. Um, as far as the recipes that you um, guys have been using, um, do you have any recommendations if people want to, for example, replicate like the dandelion cookies or anything like that? Well, I'll um, tell you, we got you. Yes, you can. Okay. The honey dandelion recipe we got offline. Uh, we got from online. And um, there's going to be, I think, three recipes out of 40 that we got from online. So that is available if you search it. And there's also a lilac lemonade is just delicious. That's online that you can follow. Um, but you could, if you want to use more traditional food, um, do the um, little wild strawberries, if you can find a, enough of them and mush those up and put them in your lemonade. You know what I wanted to add too was when I learned about that um, making those baskets, um, my very first one I gave to my grandma who was really, were just precious to me. And she took that basket and she said, oh, my mom used to make those. And I'm like, what? Like we know, I was in my forties when I made my first basket and, and I never knew that my great grandma made those baskets. And I said, what do you mean? I go, she wove. Yeah. Did she use black ash? Yeah. Did she pound the trees? Oh yeah. She, I never knew that, but you know, she went to the boarding school in, in Harbor Springs, the Indian boarding school. And, um, and she come out of there not being real proud of to be native because that's what those schools did. And um, and that's part of that historical trauma I was talking about. And and she said, my and my mom knew all the medicines. We'd walk in the woods and she'd say, that medicine's used for this and that. And she didn't want to learn it because she would, it made her not proud. You know, but um, hopefully that healing garden that um, is at the tribe will really help people. You know, it was very peaceful out there. But I was just shocked. Like, I didn't know that my grandma could do that. My great grandma. It was nice. Nice to hear. Good full circle. <clears throat> yeah. I know um, a lot of our reactions when you're going through things were um, very positive and impressed with okay. everything you guys are doing there. And I know you could hear us, but yeah. That, yeah, that I could hear us see you on my end. So I was like, hope they like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the garden looks amazing, and um, everybody was familiar um, with Manuman with wild rice and some of the process in, in our room, too. And yeah, so let really me really connect with what you're talking about. Let me throw this in, too. I forgot that the, the healing garden and all those plants um, this last summer. So that started three years ago. And this last summer, there's all kinds of pollinators coming back over there. There's um, bumblebees all over the flowers. And the, you know those big uh, grasshoppers that fly? Mm -hmm. there, there were just a ton of those out there. And you could pick them up and hold them. I remember when I was little, they would fly away. You know, but they would just walk around on you. And I, I'm like, oh, I had to call Eva that, that planted all those and tell her that the pollinators are back. It's just wonderful. It's such a good sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's remarkable about the um, her idea for doing the canoes with sweet grass. My goodness. Yeah. Any, so people could do that in their in their yards or at yeah. their homes if they could get a canoe and you know. Yeah, find a, lot people, a lot of people. people have been asking about you know where sweet grass is growing around here. I know of some people that have it personally in their yards, but it's a very yeah hit or miss kind of thing. And um, yeah, and also looking to see if they could grow some of their own. So. Um, yeah, and yes. if, you, if you get it from a nursery, um, find one that does native, like uh, Keweenaw Bay Indian community does native sweetgrass. I knew someone that got it from a nursery and they said, yeah, it's sweetgrass, but it wasn't the same. And it grew really tall and it was beautiful, but it wasn't strong. So it couldn't mm -hmm. be used in baskets and stuff. Oh, sure. You know, but yeah. Yeah. Um, we actually, uh, we have some sweetgrass uh, out in my, my library just from my own um 
personal ones, but I do have my sweetgrass earrings on today that Leah LaPointe beaded. Oh, yeah. These yes. Ones, I that she's been yeah, holding that. Yeah, with the sweetgrass because, uh, actually. Yeah, that's neat. So that's neat. at least I can smell sweetgrass right now. Yeah. <laughs> Pass it on, then they can too. Yeah. Um, definitely wanted to wear that for your talk today because you're nice. giving a good dedication to sweetgrass. So nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but she's up in Red Cliff. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really nice person. We so, do have a comment nice. online saying Perfect. thank you so much for your presentation. Your photos were beautiful from Jim and Pat Blair. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think uh, wrapping up, uh, I mean, just such good vibes here, Kathy, from your talk. Very, just very impressed um, with everything. And there's so much vibrant color and uh, the discussions today are leaving us just in such a good, oh, good. Um, good space. Yeah. Thank you so much. Big love and hugs. Oh, for sure. Miigwech. Miigwech yeah. for having me. I really appreciate it.